Welcome everybody. And uh, it's great to have you here. Nice Saturday, beautiful day out here in Florida. It's a great day to have this. I guess we're gonna be cooped up for about three hours, uh, but I hope it's gonna be well worth it here. I'm sure it will be. Mike is gonna be putting on a great uh, presentation here on uh, macro photography. Yeah, I'm gonna admit all of you guys. Got 20 people, all right, all right. Okay, I just allowed you to unmute yourselves. So if you wanna just say hi or whatever, that's fine. You can just click the little mic button. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Robbie, I see you're on there. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, I'm going to uh, welcome everybody here. We got 20 people. Looks like we got everybody tuned in here today, huh? Robbie? Yeah. Yes, How you we, do? Uh, total 20. Yeah. OK, well, I'm going to hold off on the official start here. Uh, I don't know if Mike's even on yet. I sure am. Oh, there he is. Okay. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I've been uh, uh, christened to <laughs> lead the group today, the meeting, be the moderator. And Spencer's given me a couple things here I want to talk about before Mike gets going, but I'm going to hold off again till one. Uh, although it looks like we got everybody here now, so we can probably even start a little early. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be a long meeting today, a long workshop. It's going to be three hours, but we want everybody to stick around uh, because if we do, at the very end, we've got some pretty neat stuff going on. Uh, I got two announcements to make here before Mike gets started with his presentation. Uh, at the end of today's uh, session, we'll be having a drawing where two people can win a lifetime membership. In fact, I'm gonna put the next slide on here. Uh, so two people can win the lifetime memberships to Mike's uh, Micro Photo Club. As you can see, uh, he's got a pretty neat uh, photo club uh, operation going here. And uh, the drawing will be held at the end of our session. Remember, you gotta be present to win. So stay with us. It's going to be three hours. I think you can get up and use your bathroom or get a beer or Coke or whatever you want later in the day. But uh, <laughs> this lifetime membership includes so many special things to many uh, for him to mention. So I'd like to have Mike take a moment to tell you all about the Micro Photo Club before we get started. Actually, I'm going to do that at the end of my program. Oh, okay. We want everybody to stick around to the end, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> if they want to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All of the participants are expected to use what you've learned. You want to take macro photography and send your favorite photo to us. Next Saturday, January 30th at 1 p.m., Mike has agreed to review and critique the photo submissions. <laughs> So you have until Thursday at 3 p.m. to send them to Robbie. Here's Robbie to fill you in on more detail. Go, Robbie. Um, that'll be very easy. It is Robbie at tcpcinc.org. Um, just send them then, like you said, Thursday by 3 o'clock. OK. If you have any questions, uh, I'll, I'll have something with that email address on the screen at the end of it. Okay. All right, uh, Spencer, would you like to have a few words? Um, I'm just delighted to be here. Thanks, Tom, for hosting the meeting. And um, Mike Motes has the most amazing presentation. And I'd like to thank Mike, not only for today's workshop, but for sitting in with this um, 
next Saturday. That's really where you learn a lot about photography is where you get feedback from a trained eye. And uh, Mike has agreed to be with us again. So be sure to um, learn what you've used, take some macro shots, send them to Robbie. And this time next week, we'll be reviewing them. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mike. Okie doke. All right, I'm going to stop sharing here. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike. You got it, Mike. It's saying uh, I'm not host yet. Well, anybody? Okay, we'll do this. How about that? That's better. Much better. All right, let me get that first slide up. All right. Do so you see my screen? Yep. Yep. All right, everybody. So I'm going to cover a whole bunch of different stuff here today, and uh, hopefully it'll help you um, with your shoot for this week. Now, you guys are lucky because down in Florida, you got nice warm weather and lots of plant life and cool stuff to photograph this time of year. Whereas if you were up here where I'm at in Michigan, <laughs> there's not as much to shoot up here right now. So a little tougher for us, but uh, you guys are lucky because you're in an environment where you can still go out and, and, and shoot a lot of plant life and flowers and different things that are out this time of year, probably where you're at. So that's, that's good. All right, so I'm going to start off with the equipment portion of my program. Now, I have a good friend named Bill Fortney, who's been in the photo business for over 40 years. Some of you may have heard of him. Yeah. He actually worked for Nikon for the last 10 years before he retired. And uh, I ran into Bill at a photo conference that I was speaking at. And Bill said, he goes, Mike, he says, I know you're using our D7000 Nikon camera. And it's a good camera. But how come you're not using the pro bodies that we sell, the professional bodies? And I said, well, Bill, I said, if I'm using your you know, $6,500 uh, camera, those people that are in my workshop, which uh, is about 60% that have cameras $1,000 or less, I says, those people will leave my workshop saying, well, Mike's images look really good because he's got an expensive professional body and I don't. Um, so my camera, um, when it was last sold, it was discontinued quite a few years ago, uh, was $896. And I used that camera for 10 years up until just about two months ago. And I actually purchased the Nikon um, 7500. And the only reason I upgraded um, was because it had a few bells and whistles like articulating LCD and a couple other little things, touch, don't, touch uh, screen where you could touch the screen with your finger and do things. Um, so it wasn't because I was going to get better quality images. I mean, my 7500 is not going to produce any better images than I got on my 7000. Um, but it just has those bells and whistles. So, But I used that camera for 10 years and it was to make the point to the people that were coming into my workshops is that for macro photography, you don't have to have an expensive camera body. You could uh, make top quality macro images with a $500 entry level uh, you know, camera, whether, and it doesn't matter what brand. Um, so uh, whatever you own for a camera, you'll do perfectly fine. And I'll actually talk about an image uh, later in my program that has been my most successful image that I ever photographed. And I'll talk about what camera I used when I shot that. So you see in the cost here and the equipment that I'm using, my camera was 896, that D7000. My Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens is 649. My 18 to 400 Tamron lens is 649. My tripod, that's actually the price of my uh, previous tripod from Vanguard. They just came out with a brand new one about two months ago, and I'll show you that one. Uh, and that's a little bit more pricey, but uh, my ball head is 329. So all my equipment at that time was 2703. And that's, you know, there's camera bodies, uh, mid-range and, and pros bodies, of course, that just the body alone costs more than all my equipment put together. So you don't have to spend quite as much to be a macro photographer, and you could actually get by on less than what, I, what I'm showing you right here. Because, you know, $2,700 to some people, that's a heck of a lot of money to buy camera equipment. But uh, in terms of other types of uh, of photography, that's really not a lot of money. Now, I wouldn't tell you, obviously, that my camera 
my D7000 would be a good choice for, say, a photographer that does a lot of action shots. Maybe you're shooting birds in flight or maybe you're a sports, uh, you know, photographer shooting, you know, subjects running down a field uh, because my camera won't do high frames per second like some of the better cameras. And if you're a photographer that shoots a lot in low light conditions, you need, you need high ISO with low noise. Uh, my camera won't do that either, but we don't require those things for macro photography. So again, we can get by in a lot less features than other photographers. So um, the brands, uh, only reason I'm using Nikon is because I started off with my very first digital camera in 2004. And a friend of mine was a commercial photographer. He was shooting with Fuji camera bodies at the time. And so when I was looking to buy a camera, he said, hey, you know, I'm making a living and I'm doing this with this Fuji S2. And so I says, well, I guess I'm going to buy a Fuji S2. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Uh, now, those Fuji cameras were based on a Nikon body. And so all my lenses are mounted for Nikon. So when I uh, you know, went through the uh, Fuji S3 and then went to the Fuji S5, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, get a camera that had live view. And at the time, Fuji was going to stop making SLRs and Nikon D7000 had that live view. And so that's why I made the purchase of the uh, D7000. And again, that's about 10 years ago. So I don't have any preference over any of the brands that are out there. I think every camera brand does a great job for macro photography. So <laughs> whatever you own, like I said, will do just fine. The macro lenses come in three different ranges. Uh, they come in a short range, focal length, mid range, and long or telephoto focal lengths. Now you'll see in the white area there, those are the uh, most common of the macro lenses that you'll find out there for sale. Uh, there are a few that are in between these numbers here, but uh, I, I hardly ever see them in my workshops. These are the ones I see all the time in my workshops. In the short focal length over on the left, you'll see 60 millimeter, and uh, that is uh, produced by Tamron, Nikon, and Canon. So they make 60 millimeter, but Sigma is actually a 50 millimeter. So that's their short focal length is a 50. In the mid range, on the low end of the mid range, you see a 90 millimeter Tamron there, and that's the one that I own. And then you go to the 100, that's made by Canon. And in the 105 range, you have the Sigma and Nikon. In the telephoto macro lenses, you have a 150 on the low end, and then you go to the 180, which has always been the most popular of the telephoto macro lens. But in recent years, uh, Tamron has discontinued making their 180. They don't offer it anymore. And Sigma, I heard rumor, was going to discontinue making their 180. So that would leave just Canon with the 180. And then the longest of the telephoto macro lens would be the 200 millimeter Nikon. Now up in the upper left, or I'm sorry, upper right corner, uh, you'll see a short lens that's on, that's my old Fuji S5 uh, camera. And uh, that was taken about 11 years ago, probably. That's a Rose of Sharon flower. And I'm gonna photograph that flower with that 60 millimeter lens. Now the image on the upper left, you see that's the flower shot that I took. I wanted to fill the frame. And in order to fill the frame with that large flower, I had to get in pretty close, as you can see. Now those bricks in the back room are probably about eight, maybe nine, 10 inches long. So I'm about a brick away, about probably 12 inches away from that flower to get that shot you see in the upper right or left corner. Now in the next image below, you'll see a little longer lens and that's my Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens. And uh, I'm going to try to shoot the exact same framing like I did with the 60 millimeter, but now using the 90 millimeter. <laughs> now, in order to get the exact same framing, I have to back away from that flower. I don't have to get as close. So this is what we call working distance from the subject. I've gained some working distance with that longer, uh, you know, focal length lens. And so that's a good thing. And then you go down to the bottom image. That's a 180 lens. You see, that's a big, heavy lens. And you can see how much working distance I've gained with that 180. I have to move quite a distance away to get the exact same framing like you see with that uh, 60 millimeter shot that I took in the upper left. So why is that important? Well, if that uh, flower was a live subject, let's say a dragonfly or a butterfly, probably wouldn't be too happy if I'm using a 60 millimeter lens and I'm 12 inches from its face. 
But if I'm using a longer telephoto like that 180, like you see at the bottom, I've gained all that working distance. I've got a much greater chance that a live subject is going to stay put and not going to take off if I have a lot of distance between me and that subject. So if you're uh, interested in shooting a lot of bug photography, live subjects like that, you'd probably want to go with the longer focal length uh, macro lens so you have that extra working distance. Uh, I don't recommend a 60 millimeter for nature photography outdoors um, because a lot of the subjects we shoot are low to the ground. And uh, with that 60 millimeter, you're going to be on your hands and knees all the time. Uh, it's, just, it's just working too close to your subject. Um, it can be done, uh, but it's just tougher on the body. Now, 80% of the people that come in my workshops are using lenses that are in the mid-range in the 90, the 100, the 105. Now, the reason why most people end up in that mid-range is because it's in the price range um, that they can afford. Most people aren't willing to spend what it costs to buy the telephoto macro lenses because now you're getting up into the $1,300, $1,500 price ranges. So a lot of people kind of balk at those high prices for lenses. And so they'll end up with that mid-range. You know, you can get a Tamron 90 like I have for $649 maybe another 100, 150, you can get into a Nikon or a Canon. Uh, and then the Sigma, I believe, is actually a little less expensive than that Tamron. So, so it's in a, you know, that 550 maybe to 650 $700 price range. So a lot of people are willing to spend that. And that's why I see 80% of the people that come in my workshops using mid-range lenses. Now, um, they work fine. Uh, again, they don't give you as much working distance as the telephoto lenses, uh, but they are a little better than the short range 60s and the 50s. Now, they came out with these new lenses that were zoom lenses, but they said they had macro capabilities. Now, they're not true macro lenses, all right? So make sure you understand that. They're not gonna shoot in as close into a subject as small of an area as a subject as a true macro lens. Now, when we talk about a macro lens, you'll buy one, it'll say it has a one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-one -one magnification. Now, what that means is that uh, when you are at the minimum focusing distance of your macro lens, so like my Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens, the minimum focusing distance is 11.5 inches to the subject, I believe. And that is from the sensor inside the camera to the subject, not from the front of the lens. A lot of times people think that's from the front of the lens, but it's from the sensor in the camera to the subject, 11.5 inches. Now, when I get to that range, I'm at the minimum focusing distance. So if I get in any closer, I can't focus with that lens. So once I hit that minimum focusing distance, I am now in that one-to-one -one magnification. And what that means is that whatever I have framed up when I'm at that minimum focusing, that whatever's framed up in my scene there, uh, I'm going to actually capture the actual life size of that subject I'm shooting right under my sensor, okay? So if there was a ladybug in the scene and I was photographing, I would actually be reproducing the actual life size of the ladybug onto my sensor. And that's what we call shooting life size one-to-one -one magnification. And all macro lenses will tell you that they, are, they shoot to the one-to-one -one magnification. Now, a macro zoom lens, even though it says it has some macro capabilities, it won't shoot one to one. It'll shoot maybe one to 2.7, one to three, one to three, five, one to four. So um, you're still going to shoot in a pretty darn small area. OK, but uh, you won't get in quite as small of an area as you do with a true macro lens. Now, this is the one that I'm using from Tamron. It's the 18 to 400. Excellent lens. Now. This only is designed for a crop sensor body like I have. Now, if you have a full frame sensor camera, then you're gonna to wanna to go with the 28 to 300 uh, lens from Tamron, and that would be designed for the full frame. But this one here is only designed for crop sensor bodies. Now, what I like about this wide range is that 18 millimeters, uh, if I wanna shoot, uh, you know, say an environment that I'm photographing in and for teaching purposes. Let's say I'm shooting leaves floating on this little swampy area here and I want to show you that environment that I'm shooting in. I can set that lens up on another camera body on a tripod and photograph myself out there in the field. And I've got that wide 18 millimeters to do uh, some kind of landscapey type photography. Now, if I'm in a, you know, another area where there's some duckweed and frogs heads peeking out, 
I can reach out with that 400 millimeters and capture that frog. Now, if I was using my 90 millimeter Tamron that day, I'd have to literally be in the water with the frog to capture that scene, that same size of that I've captured there. So it's nice to be able to stand back, be able to reach out with 400 millimeters and capture subjects at a distance. This lens is also my primary lens when I go into a botanical garden because I'm going to have to stay on those pathways. And, uh, you know, if I see a subject that's, you know, five, six feet in, I can't leave that pathway and walk in there to shoot with a short lens. So that 400 millimeters will reach out and frame up that subject for me. So that's nice. Now, I used to own a 180 macro lens, but I have actually sold that years ago when these new zoom lenses come out because I've got a much greater reach with this 400 than I ever had with a 180. Um, so uh, this has been a really, really good lens for me. Uh, it also, as I said, will shoot into pretty small areas, you know, so that's that's a really nice benefit with the, with these new lenses that are coming out with that kind of macro capability. I can shoot as small of an area as one and a half inch by two and a half inches. 90% of what I photograph is larger areas than an inch and a half by two and a half inches. So this lens could do 90% of what I photograph. It's an excellent lens. And um, if I needed to get into a smaller area than that, like you see there, uh, I can always pull out my Tamron 90 millimeter macro lens and that'll get me inside this little pocket watch and photograph the gears. So I have only the two lenses, you know, the Tamron 90s for getting in really close and really small areas to photograph. And then uh, the 18 to 400, as I says, can cover 90% of what I photograph. So I use that most of the time. And it's nice having a zoom lens because when I'm framing my subjects, I can kind of zoom in and out to frame the subject. Whereas with a, a fixed focal length like the Tamron 90, I have to move the tripod back and forth to get my framing. Now the tripod that I'm using, uh, it's made by Vanguard. Uh, I've been using the Vanguard tripods for quite a few years because they have a certain feature that works really well for macro photography. Now the most recent one is the VEO3 Plus. Uh, this, tri this tripod literally just hit the stores maybe two to three months ago. Uh, so it's really, really new. And they've made some upgrades over the previous version that I was using, which was the Alta Pro 2 Plus, which was also an excellent tripod, but this one has a few nice features uh, in the upgraded version. Now what's nice about the Vanguard tripod is that it has a center post that rises all the way up and then it goes horizontal as you can see here. So when I need to get out over top of subjects to photograph, then I can just uh, take that center post, take it straight up and then just bend it over into a horizontal position and then I can get over top of the subjects I wanna photograph. Now Manfrotto's had a tripod for many, many years that does the same thing. It has a, has a center post that also goes horizontal, but the problem with the Manfrotto is that uh, when I need to move that camera now closer down to the subject or maybe back away, make it farther away from the subject. You have to do it with all three of the legs, which is a hassle. Now you got to bend down there and adjust all three legs to get that camera to move up and down closer or farther away from your subject. With the Vanguard, it's got a little silver lever you see there right under the center post and you release that. And now that center post will move down or up so that we can move the camera closer or farther away from the subject. Excellent, excellent tripod. Also, you can move that camera away from the tripod. So you see here, if you're shooting flowers low to the ground, uh, you, you've got that tripod that's, you can move it right out of your way and just you know let that uh, center post hold your, your camera a little steadier while you're holding it. And then uh, the legs, as you can see here, will go straight out and you can literally put the base of the tripod right on the ground. And then with the center post extended out, you can maneuver your camera into any place you need to go if you're shooting subjects that are low to the ground like this. Now, another really nice feature that they built into the VO, VEO 3 Plus over the previous model uh, was that you can take one of the legs, unscrew it, and turn it into a monopod. So you can take your head off your tripod, put it on your monopod now, and now you, you can go into some of the botanical gardens that may say that, well, you can't bring a tripod in but they'll allow you to bring a monopod in. So that's really nice that you got a tripod and a monopod. Now, this system here, uh, unfortunately, when they started shipping these over from wherever it is they make them, 
they didn't think to sell this as just a tripod. Unfortunately, they, they built a head with it. So you have to buy it with the head. Uh, and this is the uh, Vanguard SBH 100 that comes on that tripod when you buy it. And it runs 249. So even at 249 with a head on it, that's a pretty darn good price. Um, you know, there's a lot of tripods that are way more expensive than that, uh, but it won't do what this one does. So uh, with the head, uh, again, uh, it's an excellent price. Uh, I've talked to the people at Vanguard and they are working on trying to bring some new tripods in without the heads and sell it just as the tripod. Because a lot of you may already have a head and you don't you don't necessarily need one uh, but if you purchase this one here with the head you've got an extra head as a backup or you could sell it to a friend and maybe get some money back on it now most of you probably have a ball head that that's similar to like you see here on the vanguard head it has a big metal housing at the base has a little ball up in the top and it has a little u slot in the front so you see that little u slot right there and that U slot is typically not used much for landscape and wildlife photographers because they just shoot straight ahead all the time. But for macro photographers, we shoot a lot towards the ground. We aim our camera down towards the ground. So now we have that little U slot and we can maneuver our camera. So we are a little bit limited because we have to work within that U slot. And then we might have to pivot the ball head back and forth to get our framing. And one thing about macro photography is you are always going to be maneuvering your camera in all kinds of weird positions to get the framing you want on your subjects whether you're down low on the ground or you're even standing up you're always going to be maneuvering that camera all over the place to get the framing you want again not like landscape wildlife where they just set up their camera and shoot straight ahead we're always maneuvering into all kinds of places now the head that i'm using is made by a company called acrotech small company that makes this head and it's uh called the ultimate ball head. That's what they call it. Now, as you can see, this is a totally different, unique type head. They've cut away all that big metal housing like you saw in the last one. So that is lighting this head up to the point where it is literally the lightest ball head that you can buy as far as if you're looking for more lightweight. Um, so they've cut away all this area here. This is also made out of aluminum, so that makes it even lighter. And then they've cut away the front area here so that I have full range of movement with my camera. I no longer have to work in a use slot. I can literally move that camera any position I need to go to to set up my framing for my shot. So this makes my life a lot easier when I need to get my camera in position to shoot. It's not an inexpensive head. It runs 329. Um, there are other heads that are much more expensive than this one. Of course, there's a lot of heads that are a lot less than this one. Uh, so it's not a not a cheap head, but if you can afford it, um, this is a great head. Uh, it's good for any type of photography, but really good for the macro photographer. So you put that head on top of that tripod I showed you, you have the best setup for macro photography as far as getting you into positions you need to uh, and also getting the framing uh, with that uh, ultimate ball head. Now, I don't have time to cover all the, the accessories. I will cover some accessories here today. <clears throat> Um, but I wanted to make sure I covered this one, which is the most important accessory that you need to pick up. And this is called a diffuser. Now, this is a Dame's Rocket Flower, and uh, it's supposed to be all purple. But as you can see here, the petals on the top portion look more pink than they do purple. Now, you know that when you're out shooting, say it's a noon on a sunny day like you're having down there in Florida right now, that harsh sunlight from overhead sometimes comes down and it'll wash out colors on subjects you're photographing, right? This is shot on a cloudy day. On an overcast day was, was when this was photographed. Even on cloudy days, the intensity of the light and the clouds overhead coming down on these flowers will wash out those colors. And it's generally things that are running somewhat parallel to the sky that gets washed out. So what you need to do is get yourself a 12 inch diffuser. This is the only size that I've ever used as long as I've been shooting 20 years. Um, they do make larger sizes, but this is nice and compact at 12 inches and it'll actually fold down into itself. So it'll be about four inch circle when you collapse it and you can literally put it in your pocket. 
Um, it is a translucent type material, so it does allow light to come through, uh, so it doesn't shade the subject completely, but it allows enough light to come through, but it filters out all the bad light that's coming through, okay? So once we put that diffuser over top of that dame's rocket, it brings the color back to the natural purple it's supposed to be. So you can see an image on the left, no diffuser image on the right with the diffuser. And like I said, this is on a cloudy day. So most people would assume that you already have a big diffuser already up there with that uh, system of clouds. But uh, unfortunately, there's still enough harsh light coming down from overhead that'll wash out colors. At that uh, same day, I was walking down the trail and I happened to uh, I remember look to my left and I saw this leaf and I thought that's a perfect example of what, what I need to show people. Now this leaf, as you can see the top portion, that is the part that's running parallel to the sky. And remember, this is the same cloudy day. Look at the front of that, that leaf dips down 90 degrees to the sky on the front portion of it. And that retains its color. So it's that stuff that's running parallel, all right? So we just take our diffuser and add it up over top and it brings that color back. Now, it's not 100% back, back on the top portion like it is on that front portion there, but at least the top portion has enough color there that I can go into my post-processing tools and I can darken that top section down to match up with the front. The image on the left side, because it's washed out to a white, there's no color there, so it would be very difficult to ever try to bring that back to the uh, dark red that it should be. So again, very important tool. And this is very inexpensive. It's like uh, $15, you know, uh, if, if you want to purchase one, it's not expensive. Now let's say it's a sunny day. On sunny days, I'm diffusing my subject 100% of the time. Hear that? 100% of the time. I do not let sunlight hit my subject. And the reason being is because there's three things happen when sun hits your subject. It can also wash out colors just like it does on a cloudy day. Uh, it can alter the colors. It can really alter the color of the subject. And it can create shadows in areas that I may not want a shadow. So what I want is a nice even light hitting my subject. So I'm diffusing that sunlight 100% of the time, unless I'm using sunlight for backlighting. If that's the case, then that's OK. Now, you see the image on the left. That's a sumac branch. That's early morning sunlight hitting that sumac branch. And you can see uh, it has altered the colors. It's turned those green leaves into yellowish green leaves. Now we don't want yellowish green leaves because that's not the actual color. But once I put my diffuser between that branch and the sunlight, you see on the right side, it brings the color back to the natural green that it's supposed to be. So that's why I'm saying sunlight, not good hitting your subject because again, can wash out the colors, it can alter the colors, and it can create shadows in areas that don't want shadows. So make sure you get yourself a 12 inch diffuser and take it with you all the time because it doesn't matter whether it's sunny or cloudy, you're, you, you, you know, for sure you're gonna be using it on sunny days, cloudy days, um, you're going to be uh, using it occasionally depending on the subject and how it's angled to the light overhead. And you guys live in the sunshine state, so you're going to use a lot more than I do up here. Um, this month here of January in Michigan has been pretty much cloudy every day. I think today is actually the first sunny day I think we've seen all this month. You're going to also use this indoors. Uh, when I shoot indoors, and I'm shooting subjects that might have a little sheen in the, in the petals, uh, like this little succulent here has got a little bit of a sheen in it. Uh, you will get light rays that'll sometimes hit it at a certain angle and create little white hot spots in there. So with the diffuser, it'll solve that problem. It'll just give you that nice even light and get rid of all those hot spots. Now, some people say, well, could you do that with a polarizer? Um, when I started out many years ago, I actually tried uh, the same, tried to get the same effect with a polarizer and it did work sometimes but it doesn't work 100% of the time. Polarizers only work when they're at a certain angle to the light. They have to be at a certain angle to, to be able to perform properly. Uh, also, um, it, it polarizers are gonna run you a couple hundred dollars for a good polarizer, not a cheap one, a good one. Uh, whereas this diffuser works 100% of the time and it only costs you about $15. So get a diffuser uh, and that'll take care of all those issues with any light that you're running into. 
Now you're wondering about uh, holding this. Now you're thinking, am I gonna be out in the field having to hold this all the time, this uh, little uh, diffuser? Um, you could hold it if you wanted to, or you could get this uh, clamp system. This could be your assistant when you're out there by yourself. Now you can see on the left side, there's a large black clamp there and that can uh, attach to a tripod leg. Then it has a flexible tubing as you see there. And then at the other end, there's another clamp and that will accommodate your diffuser, all right? Also, you could use that other clamp on that end to uh, maybe clamp on the stem of a flower. If it's a little bit breezy and you want to steady that flower from moving back and forth. So this would be what you would want uh, if you were uh, alone out there and you didn't want to hold the diffuser while you're trying to work your camera, you could actually use this clamp system. Now that would only work if you're in really close to your subject. You could clamp it on the tripod, might have enough reach there to put your diffuser over top of your subject. But let's say you're using a long focal length lens like a 180 macro lens or a 200 millimeter macro lens. You're gonna be three, four feet away from your subject. That flexible tubing doesn't reach out far enough if you've attached it to the leg of the tripod. So what Wimberly did, the manufacturers of the clamp, they came up with a stake. Now this stake can stake in the ground next to your subject and then you can go ahead and clamp onto that stake. And at the other end, you can clamp onto the stem of your flower, or you could put your diffuser in there and hold your diffuser over top of your subject. That way you'd be independent from that diffuser and you can move it around with your tripod and framing your, your shot and photographing and not having to worry about holding the diffuser or again, clamping on the stem of the flower to steady it. So that's a clamp and uh, again, stake system. Uh, those two work really well. They're made by Wimberly. LED lights. Uh, I have used some LED lights over the years. Uh, when they first came out many, many years ago, um, they were actually designed to go on the hot shoe of your camera because the camera manufacturer started to include video into our SLR so we could do video. And what they found was that when people were doing their videos, they wanted more light in their videos if it was, say, dark, dark conditions. And so people were designing these LED lights that would fit in the hot shoe at top of the camera, and they were run by batteries. And you would turn that light on. It would give you a constant light source while you're walking around doing your video. So that's what they were originally designed for. And when I saw these lights when they were coming out, I thought, you know what? Um, that might be pretty cool for macro photography for a little bit of fill light or special effect type light. Now, I don't use flash systems. All the images that I photograph are done with whatever natural light is available when I'm shooting. Now, that could be outdoors shooting in a dark woods, in my home shooting. I'm using the natural light that's there, available light, and that's how I shoot all my images. Now, on occasion, I may want to add a little fill light into an area just to brighten up some part of that subject, okay? So I can just hand hold this little LED light. Now, this little light here is the smallest one that I've owned. When they first came out, they were ra rather large. They were pretty big. Uh, and, and so then I, uh, uh, I, I kept watching year after year and they were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And this, this little guy here made by Litra, L-I-T-R-A, is only a one inch by a one inch by a one inch. It's a cube, really tiny. And what I like about it is it can just fit in any small little pocket within my backpack. Doesn't take up hardly any room. Very powerful light. That little light has a, a really bright light to it. It's got three different settings. So it's low, medium and high. And then it's rechargeable so that you can just plug it in when you get home or before you go out to shoot and uh, it, it doesn't require batteries, all right? So it's a really, really good little light. It's not cheap though. I think it runs about $79, so it's not an inexpensive light. But you know, when these things first came out, the very first lights were like $350, $400. So that obviously that's come down in, in price quite a bit over when they first started building these things. Now, when I got the first LED light, you can see here in my hand, that's one of the earlier ones. And you can see how large that is compared to my little cube that I'm using now. Uh, I was just indoors playing with it. And I would just maneuver it around my subject, you know, just in my hand. I would just look through my viewfinder, watch my image, and then just go ahead and move that 
light around the subject until I get the light the way I like it. And then I go ahead and photograph it. Now, if I was using a flash system on top of my camera, I wouldn't know how that flash is going to affect that subject until I actually photographed it. So I would set up the flash, I would photograph the subject, and then I would have to evaluate the image on my my screen to see if I liked what you know what it what the lights doing to it. And if I didn't like it, I'd have to make an adjustment. And again, each time I make an adjustment, I don't even know how it's going to affect the subject till I photograph it. So I never cared for flash systems for that reason. But with this light here, I can maneuver around, see the light live as I'm looking at it until I get it to where I like it. And then I can go ahead and photograph it with one shot and be done. Now, I also found that I could do some fun special effect with this while you know I'm shooting in my house. Like right now with winter, it was, you know, I don't know, 20 degrees this morning. So uh, I, I might stay in the house and photograph rather than go outside. Now, I got a tulip and I darkened down a room, I darkened the room down, and then I set up the tulip, set that light up so that I was shining the light down inside that tulip. And then when I photographed it, as you can see here, I got a nice glow on the outside of the petals because the petals are translucent. So the light kind of filters through the petals. So you got this nice dark room, background just came out black, and you can see how the nice effect happened on that tulip. So that was a fun thing to do. And then uh, in the springtime, I brought in a dandelion and I picked off all the little seed heads except for just around the perimeter like you see there. And then I set it up and took one of my lights and put the light behind it so I was backlighting it and creating that silhouette effect. Uh, and the light when it comes out of the camera would be white uh, the background would be white, but I actually turned it to a yellow color in Nick software. So you can do a little bit of special effect. Now, when I got my very first LED light and I was experimenting in the home, it was around this time in the dead of winter. Uh, so I wasn't able to use it outside yet until spring. And uh, when spring came, uh, dragonflies were coming out. So I uh, went out to photograph this dragonfly. It was early morning. He's covered in dew, so he's not going anywhere. So I can set up my tripod and frame him and everything. Um, shot this with just the natural light. And what happens is because I'm, I'm getting a high dynamic range of light here, I've got this real bright wings and then I've got this dark body and the camera can't get that, that range of light correctly. So it's going to underexpose something or overexpose something. And so uh, when I shot this, as you can see here where the wings are pretty much exposed, it's darkened the body down, it's too dark. Uh, so that's one of the problems with shooting natural light. If you run into a situation where you have high dynamic range, you, you need some little extra light to kind of fill in a little area here and there. But I generally don't run into high dynamic range. I would say 90% of what I shoot is there's no high dynamic range, so I don't run into an issue with exposures, all right? So on this one here, I wanted to add a little bit of light into the body there. So what I did was I pulled out that LED light and I just set it on a low setting and then I shined it on the uh, dragonfly and you can see it brighten that body right up. You can see even inside the head there, the back side of the head. So there it is with no light and by just adding that little bit of fill light in there, just brighten that up. And again, the thing is that's nice about using a handheld light as I can see how the light is affecting the subject as I'm putting the light on there. Where again, with a flash system, you wouldn't know what it's gonna do until you photograph it and then you evaluate it. Uh, but I can just set up my light, say, oh, that's what I want right there and then photograph it. Now, this is another situation. Now, I uh, remember I had talked about uh, letting the sunlight hit my subject for backlighting. And that's what's happening here. This is a little teasel, a young teasel that's popping up. And I, I want to uh, I want to use that back, backlighting of the sun hitting the back of the subject to create that that kind of glow around the uh, the outside here, the little spikes to get this nice glow and all the little hairs coming off the stem kind of glow. And so that's like nice rim lighting around there. And that's kind of what I wanted. But the problem is with that intense light hitting that outside area, see now it's going to be really dark on this side. This is the shaded side. So it's kind of dark in here so you don't see as well. So I wanted to add a little bit of light on there with my LED light just to brighten that up in that center part. So I added the light and look how much brighter it is. See, I still have my rim lighting. I'm still getting that nice bright lighting around the outside that I wanted. 
Uh, but now I've got more light in here so you can see all the fine details of the little spikes and all the little dew drops that are in there. So uh, again, from that to that by just adding that little bit of fill light on there with that LED light. And as I said, I like it because I can see it live as I'm adding the light, how it's affecting it, if it's too much or not enough. This is something that I came across, uh, <clears throat> Hunt's photo, uh, Gary at Hunt's photo, he had uh, uh, told me about this stool that he had. And he says, hey, you think you'd be interested in one of these stools? These are really cool little stools that I'm selling. And I says, Gary, I says, no, nah, I don't use a stool. I says, I can get down on the ground and get back up. I says, I'm, I'm, I don't really need a stool. He says, well, what about people that come to your workshops? I says, well, you're right. I says, there are a lot of people in my workshops say if they get down on the ground, they're not getting back up. I says, so that would be something that would be good for, the, for uh, people that need to sit when they're doing their flower photography um, and they can't get down and get back up. So this is a really interesting engineered stool. Um, they put a lot of thought into this. Now, it uh, comes collapsed like you see here. It's, uh, it says it's nine and about a half inches wide uh, and only two and a half inches high. So it's, it's really narrow and it's, uh, it's very compact. Uh, it has a strap system and that strap you can throw over your head and, and carry it on your shoulder and it'll just hang down at your side. Now, what's cool about this thing is it actually expands up, as you can see over on the left here, it'll expand up to about 18 inches high, which is about the standard size of a, a, a normal chair that you would sit on, about 18 inches. And then it has 11 adjustable positions from the full height all the way down to where it collapses into itself. And um, you can adjust it if you're taller or shorter, or you want to get down a little bit lower. You can set it whatever setting you want by just you know taking it up, taking it down, and then uh, and, and and then when you're done, just collapse it into itself. Uh, it has these holes like you see here. Uh, you put your thumb in one hole and your finger in the other one, and the other side it has two holes, and that's what you use to expand it out and collapse it. It's really cool, and it runs. Um, they're normally about forty-five dollars, uh, but you can find them for about thirty-five dollars. Now this is my studio. This is where I do all my flower photography indoors. It's on my stairway and you're probably, why would you set up on your stairway? Well, that stairway area is my foyer in front of my house and that foyer is two stories high. It's a real high ceiling in there and up in the front of my house is a huge window up front and that big window allows tons of natural light to come in and light up that stairway. So it's the best place in my house to photograph with natural light um, because it's the brightest place. Now, in years past, I have set up a table alongside of a window, a big window, or uh, we have a door wall, with these big glass door walls, and we set up a table next to there uh, and have natural light coming in. But the problem is the, the from the window outside, that light is just coming in at one direction, whereas here it seems to, seems to wrap itself around the subject. It's coming in from all different angles there. So that is the best place in my house to photograph. Now, obviously, I don't want stairs as the background behind my flowers. So I have to put something behind there to create a background. Now, in the beginning, many, many years ago, I was using black fleece, or some people call it felt, uh, or white backgrounds, white paper, mat board, uh, foam core, stuff like that. And I would put black and white backgrounds behind, behind all my flower shots. Well, it doesn't look natural to me shooting with black and white backgrounds. Um, I wanted something that made it look like I was shooting these tulips that you see here out in the field somewhere. So it's a natural green background that I would get when I shoot out in the field. So what I did was I went out to one of the local parks, had some tall grass and one of the open fields and set up my tripod. Now I'm using my 90 millimeter Tamron lens. All right. Uh, I've got my f-stop set at the smallest f-stop. So that's, let's say a 2.8, depending on your macro lens, could be a 3.5. Um, so make sure you're using, if you have a macro lens, use that for this. Uh, and also make sure you set it at the smallest f-stop number. 
Now, when you manually focus, which you should be doing, I manual focus on every image that I photograph is all done with manual focus. And uh, when you get that subject in focus, if you take that focusing ring on your lens and you move it a little bit left or a little bit right of the focus point, that subject starts to go out of focus. Now, what you want to do is take that focusing ring and then rotate it way, way, way to the left and then way, way, way to the right. One of the two ways, either left or right on your lens, is going to take that subject you see right there to a solid blur. It's going to literally take it completely out of focus and it'll be a solid blur. When you get it to the solid blur, you photograph it and you end up with that right there. So that subject right there with it completely out of focus with the focusing ring will turn into that solid green right there. And that is a natural green that you'll get when you're outdoors shooting with some flowers in front of that grass and you're able to blur that grass out. So my 90 millimeter Tamron, which I use, I have to turn my focusing ring to the right side. And if I go to the left side, it won't take it to a solid color. So mine goes to the right side. So check your lens out, go both ways and see which one, you know, which way works the best to get it to that solid color. Now, let's say you're looking at this and thinking, uh, I like a little bit of texture in there, a little bit of blotchiness or something in there than just a solid color. So let's let's set up on another subject. So this is some uh, subjects here that I'm going to photograph. And again, I'm just going to take it to uh, not to the point where it goes to a solid blur, but I'm going to take it to a point where there's still a little bit of details in there and then photograph it and end up with that. So you see, I get a little bit of shading of darks and lights and uh, and so some people may think that looks a more natural as a background than that solid color. But I'm going to show you a bunch of images later where I photographed a lot of subjects out in the field and I was able to blur those backgrounds to a solid color. So that is natural. Now, let's say you're out shooting some grasses that have little yellow flowers in there that you're going to get a little bit of a more of a yellowish green than the green green of just the grass. And then if you're shooting with some pink flowers in there, and then you're going to get uh, a little bit of pink shading in with the greens. I like to go to botanical gardens where they have uh, large, you know, fields of colorful flowers. And I just set up and I take it out of focus and get different shades of different colors uh, and, and photograph. And then I have different kind of backgrounds. Now, when you're using these printed backgrounds indoors, you'll want to print these on a matte paper. Don't use glossy papers, don't use lusters, don't use semi-gloss. Make sure it's a matte paper that you're printing on so there's no sheen on there. If you put a glossy paper behind your subject that's angled right, the light hits it, it's gonna cause it a kind of a, a whitish color in there. It might just even cause a glare. Uh, so you wanna make sure you do it on a matte paper. And you can print these at any size you want when you're indoors and you can set them up behind your subjects uh, and, uh, and, and that'll be a natural, background that you shot out in nature that you can now bring in in the house and put them behind your flowers so that it looks like you shot that subject out in the field. All right, now I want to talk about depth of field. Uh, when I talk to macro photographers and I ask them what are they struggling with, it's always the depth of field. It's the f-stops. They don't know where they should be setting their f-stops. And so that's always the number one thing that I, I hear when I'm talking to new macro photographers that are just getting into this, they're trying to figure out what f-stop to use and how much depth of field or how much is in focus on those different f-stops. It's actually very simple. It's not that difficult. Image on the left side, um, that is a style that uh, a lot of macro photographers that shoot flower photography like to do. It's, it's what we call a soft focus flower photography. And you can see there's very little in focus. All there is in the focus is this little stamen here that's sticking out of the center of that flower. And then you can see all around the outside of the flower, it's softened into a blur, which is, gives it kind of a dreamlike look, okay? Again, it's very popular style amongst macro photographers. Uh, a lot of them like to do this. Lens Baby is a really popular lens that uh, a lot of photographers use for flower photography to get that real soft blur. But I'll tell you, you can do the same thing with your macro lens as you do with a lens baby. Um, you know, I can get all kinds of soft blur just like a lens baby, just with my standard macro lens. So um, 
that is again a style that Mac photographers like. But I will tell you that if you're showing this image, like you see on the left, to your family and friends, the first thing out of their mouth is, "Why is it so much out of focus?" <laughs> when I was in the art shows for seven years, I was you know showing some of these soft focus flowers framed up on the walls, and there were two ladies that were looking at one of my soft focus flower shots, and the one lady says to the other one, "She goes, look at this image here. It's all out of focus." And she didn't mean that in a good way. She meant there was something wrong with that image. And there was a guy and a woman standing there. And the guy says, the woman, I guess it was his wife. He says, I don't know much about photography, but at least I can get him in focus. So basically he was, you know, saying that I don't know what I'm doing here. And I'm showing people images of, of, of shots with 90% of it out of focus. No, it was meant to be that way. And that's, again, something that macro photographers understand, but uh, the general public, you know, the non-photographers, non-artistic type people, they don't understand this type of photography. Even judges in contests, uh, I've had many people and tell me that in their, uh, in their uh, club monthly contest, they'll have a judge there and they'll post a soft focus flower image like this. And the judge will say, well, I wish there was more in focus. So even sometimes other photographers don't even understand it. So it's really something that's a niche area that just macro photographers seem to appreciate and do. Now, the image on the right side, you see that uh, from the top to the bottom and from side to side and front to back on that subject, it's all in focus. Now, that's done with the highest f-stops. If I want to get everything in focus, maximum depth of field, I'm going to f32, uh, the biggest f-stop that you have on your lens. All right, and that's going to give me the maximum depth of field I need. Now, these are examples of images that I shot out in the field. And you can see this is a trillium flower. It's a early spring woodland flower. And I wanted to do a soft focus on it. So you can see a edge of the petal here, right on this edge here and this little edge here, that is all that's in focus is that little tiny edge. And this was shot with a 3.5 f-stop on a 180 macro lens. And all I'm getting in focus is that little eighth of an inch. Uh, and then it just softens down into the flower and blurs into the background. Same with this little dragonfly here. You use a small f-stop number. You're going to get just the face in focus. And then you can see his body starts to go soft. And then you get the green grass in the background that blurs out. And this little curling fern, um, just focused on the center part of the fern right here. And then with the small f-stop, you get the nice shallow depth of field on the bottom and the top of the image. Now, this is the style that I actually prefer. I think soft focus flowers is fun to do and I think they look nice, but I actually prefer everything in focus. And uh, when I was in the art show business, everybody that bought my images preferred the everything in focus images. And when I entered contests over the uh, first few years when I started back in uh, 2004, 2005, 2006, I was entering into some contests and I was entering in, uh, you know, my everything in focus image. And I was also entering in soft focus. I never won anything with a soft focus image, but I won awards with the everything in focus images. So this is a rose and uh, you can see from top to bottom, side to side, front to back, it's all in focus. And again, that's at the highest f-stops because when you're in really, really close to your subject, you're getting very shallow depth of field if you're not getting into those high f-stops. Same with this agave here, front to back, top to bottom, side to side, all in focus. And this is a black-eyed Susan with a couple little critters here. They're sharing this flower and you can see over on the lower left, a little hoverfly and a grasshopper over on the opposite side. And I wanted to make sure you saw all the nice details of those two critters and the nice details of that center part. So. Uh, I wanted everything in focus, went to the highest f-stops. Now I'm going to show you the two extremes from the high to the low and uh, set up this ruler on a table. Now I'm using a 90 millimeter Tamron lens and you can see front of my lens is at an angle to that ruler. Most photographers would want to get parallel to that ruler. Uh, which I would want to do too if I could, but let's say that you can't get parallel. Let's say you can't get that camera out over top of that table and get parallel. And that's going to happen when you're out shooting sometimes. You can't always get parallel to your subject. You have to learn how to shoot on poor angles. Now at that angle, in that close to that ruler, 
On the left side, that's a 2.8. And you can see all I'm getting in focus on that ruler is one eighth of an inch. And that's how we do that soft focus flower photography. Using that small f-stop, you're getting very little in focus, one eighth. Now, if you just go to that line that's outside of that one eighth right there, and this line right here, those are already starting to go a little out of focus. So you're only getting one eighth of an inch in focus. And then you can see when you go to the top and the bottom, it just blurs into a solid color eventually as the outside. Now, if I go to the opposite end, go up to the highest F stop, F32, you can see now I'm getting the ruler all in focus. Now it's a little bit soft right at the outer edges right down here. All right, maybe just a little bit up here, but there's still enough definition there that in my post-processing with sharpening tools, I can sharpen that up and make it all look nice and sharp. So again, F32, you can see I'm getting everything in focus. All right, now here we have a spruce cone and I have set up that spruce cone to hang four feet in front of the spruce tree. So that, that cone is four feet in front of the needles of that spruce tree. So remember that. Now I'm using a 180 macro lens. I have focused on the front portion here, this flat part of the cone right here. I've got the front of my lens parallel to the flat part of that cone. And I'm shooting at a 3.5 on that 180, smallest f-stop. Now it's gonna get all that and focus on the flat part because I am parallel in the front of my my lens to that cone. So even if I'm only getting an eighth of an inch in focus, at least that's flat in front of my lens is parallel. So I'm going to get all the cone in focus. But where this cone starts to dip down right here, you can see all this area is out of focus down here. And that's just a little fraction off from that flat part. It's already out of focus. Now look at the needles here. These needles are out in the fore, foreground in front of the cone. You can see they're out of focus. But now that tree is four feet behind that cone. And as you can see, 3.5 doesn't have enough depth of field to reach back and pull in any details from those needles in that spruce tree. And that's a good thing. That's what we want when we shoot flower portraits, bug portraits, things like that. We want that nice, clean background so it doesn't do any competing with our main subject and our main subject stands out against that background. So that's good. Uh, it's blurring out my background really well, but the problem is it's not getting me enough depth of field on my subject. I want my subject all in focus, front to back. So what we need to do is go to a higher f-stop to get more in focus. Now let's go up to f8. All right, f8 now gives me the depth of field I need to get my cone all in focus. So now here it's in focus, but not quite enough depth of field to get all the needles in focus. There's still some needles that are not sharp up here. But look what happens. F8 has just enough depth of field to reach back four feet and start pulling in some shading on those needles, some lights and darks and stuff. And it's starting to get a little cluttered back there. And we don't want clutter in our background. No, it's not terrible clutter, but it is starting to get a little bit cluttered up there at the F8. So now I still want more depth of field because I want to get those needles in the very front up here in focus, the ones that are up here, right there. I want to make sure those are all in focus, right? So I've got to go up to another f-stop higher to get that in focus. Let's just double it and go to f-16. Now f-16 gives me plenty of depth of field, which now my subject is completely in focus, but look what happens to my background. Now f-16 has got more depth of field, reaching back, starting to pull in some details of the needles now put a little more definition in those needles and now really cluttering up my background, taken away from my main subject. So that's where macro photographers struggle. They tell me that, you know what, um, if I'm shooting with the small left stop numbers, I'm able to blur up my background really well, but I'm not getting enough depth of field on my subject. And then when I go to the higher F stop and get my subject in focus, now I'm bringing in the details of the background and it's messing up my image, all right? So most photographers assume that it's only about the f-stops, but it's not. Uh, there's other things you need to know to do this right. Now, these are examples of images that I photographed out in the field, you know, got down on my hands and knees and photographed these things. And um, as you can see here, I have a fully focused subject and a nice clean background behind there. Look at this jewel weed with some uh, little dew drops and a leaf, a little refraction in those dew drops. 
And uh, that is grass way off in the distance that just blurred out behind that subject. So everything's in focus except for my background. So that's kind of what we want. Same with this guy right here. Whole flower in focus, nice clean background. And critter portraits. We want our critters to be all in focus and we want that nice clean background behind it. And a little hoverfly on a knapweed flower. And you can see all in focus with a nice clean background. And this little dew covered dragonfly on a purple cone flower with a nice blue background that was a pond that was off in a distance that I blurred out. So this is uh, really what we're looking to do. We don't want this. This is what we don't want. We don't want a nice dragonfly with a cluttered up background behind it with all kinds of lights and darks and you know shading and stems and things in the background. We want a nice clean background behind it. And this is very simple to do. It's not difficult at all. You guys want to take a break? Hello. Want to take a 10 minute break? I think people, what they're doing is uh, if they have to take a break, they're just leaving the computer for a second and then coming back. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful program you're putting on, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, we got a lot more to learn yet. <laughs> um, are you recording this? Yes. Okay, uh, good. I don't know if my uh, cloud account with Zoom will take and do a three hour total. Well, the, the program is only actually two hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, you had it scheduled for one to three. But it'll go longer because we can take questions at the end. Um, and then if yeah, you're doing drawing. Another, that, so. I think we had another hour for Q&A. Yeah. Your program goes for three hours. And by the way, we will not release the video to any unpaid people. Uh, that was uh, kind of an objection. Mm -hmm. A lot of us said if we paid to attend this, uh, we shouldn't share it to people that haven't, and that's for your protection as well. So uh, I'm I'm okay with you can show it to anyone you want, but oh, I understand okay. what you're saying. If, okay. if you want to just keep it for the people that paid, and and maybe not be fair for the ones that didn't pay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I could put it on uh, YouTube and put a yeah. link for only uh, certain uh, link applicants could see it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, there's another club out of, uh, uh, which was it? Uh, I forget what state it was in, but they put it on YouTube and um, and, and that was perfectly fine. I, I had no problem with that. So, okay. All right. So now let's talk about how we get. The Whoops. There you go. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay. All right, so we're trying to get that subject in focus, but we want that nice, clean, blurred background behind it. And this is how you do it. This is the key to flower and critter portraits. Now, what you need to do is you need to find the right subject to photograph. In other words, I'm going to be looking for an isolated subject that is as far away from clutter as possible. And we need to find the right camera angle to that subject with the background as far away as possible. And the farther away the background is from the subject, the higher the f-stop can go. So uh, we want to make sure when we're shooting these subjects, we want to find an isolated subject away from the clutter. And then we want that background to be as far away as possible. All right. So you remember that Dame's Rocket Flower that I showed you uh, earlier in the show where I put the diffuser over it and brought the color back to the purple? This is where I shot it. This is the cloudy day that I shot it on. And as you can see, these flowers grow in a lot of clutter. And so they grow in big groupings like you see here. All right. And that's not what you want to, you know, shoot into you, because if you're going to pick out any of the flowers that you see in this clutter here, where's your background? Well, it's literally inches behind the subject. And typically, you know, if I was to bring out a photographer that was just getting into the macro photography and I says, here's some flowers here, which one would you pick out to photograph? See, they would go and they would look at all the different flowers and all this big group here, or maybe over here, and they would pick one out and they say, okay, I, I like this one right here. And then the problem is, again, 
your background is literally inches behind it. That's not going to work. So when you get to these big areas where you have lots of, you know, congestion of flowers like that and clutter, you want to go to the outside perimeters and you're always going to find a few flowers out here, out in the open, away from all that clutter. And those are the ones you want to decide which one of those you want to shoot. Now, the one that I picked is actually right here. And I'll show you that right there. Look at that. That little guy is sitting there all by itself. There's no clutter behind it, like you see over here. And there's actually a wooded area back there. And that's probably 15 feet behind that flower. And that's a good distance to have behind there because, again, the farther away that background goes, uh, the higher we can get into our f-stops. So uh, you remember that spruce cone that I showed you? Uh, that that first shot was 3.5 and, and I was, uh, you know, getting the subject uh, not all in focus, but I was able to blur out the background like you saw. And then when I went to F8, what happened? That, that F8 had enough depth of field to start pulling those needles at four feet behind that, uh, that spruce cone. Uh, and then we went to F16 and started pulling more needles in. Now, if we were shooting that uh, spruce cone and the background of that tree had moved to 10 feet behind the cone and we were shooting in that F8, F8 wouldn't have enough depth of field to pull in any of those details. It would just blur it out. And if that spruce tree was to move 20 feet behind that cone, we could get up into the F11s, even F16s, and get the subject all in focus and blur out that background. So like this Dame's Rocket right here, with that background being 15 feet behind it, uh, I'm able to uh, get into that F11, maybe F13 range, get it all in focus and blur out that background. Now you're going to have to get down low to do this because you can't be shooting from up above uh, to that flower because the ground is going to be right behind it and that's going to be just a you know a couple feet away. You have to get down low and kind of be line of sight of the lens running parallel with the earth, you know, so that you can get that background far off in the distance. So here's a little dame's rocket flower. Now this. I'm sorry, not a danger. This is a bladder campion flower. Now that flower, as you can see, is in all this heavy grass and all this clutter. So again, that's not a good choice because you're going to have all this nasty background stuff behind it. But where this grass is growing up above, that same flower had grown right straight through and it's way up here. See, and, and there's nothing behind that flower except this wooded area and that wooded area is about 20 feet away. So now I can get my camera in there, shoot it and uh, get it all in focus and blur out that background and get up in that F11s and F16s. And I've shot many of these out in open fields where the, the uh, subject that's in the background might be 50 feet away or 100 feet away in big open fields. And you can literally shoot them at 22 all day long and, and blur out those backgrounds. Um, so as you can see, this is not complicated stuff. This is pretty easy. Um, it's it's uh, just a matter of, again, finding an isolated subject with background off in a distance. And sometimes it's a matter of um, setting up your camera angles. So like, let's say that you're shooting a subject and you set up your camera and you see your background is 10 feet away. And then maybe you move a foot to the right and now the background, there's a different background, but it's 20 feet away. And maybe you move you know, a couple feet over to the left. And now the background of another subject is maybe 30 feet away. Well, obviously you want to get set up so that your background is as far away as possible. And the farther away that background goes, the higher the f-stop goes. And you're going to get all your subjects in focus and still maintain that blurred background. Now let's say that you come into a situation like this. These are oxide daisies and they're nice little daisies to photograph, um, but look at where they're growing. They're in all this tall grass and there's literally no flower in this area here. There's, there's little white daisies all through here. There's literally none of these flowers that you can photograph with the background off at a distance because it, all the grass is growing up through these and it's all too tall. So. Um, then it's one of those situations where you have to learn when to walk away because you don't want to shoot a poor image. You know, there's no point in shooting a flower image with a nasty looking background. It's better to just go find something else to photograph rather than shoot these oxide daisies. Now, you do have an option here. Let's say that you really needed to get a shot of that oxide daisy for whatever reason, you really had to get a shot of that. 
you do have an option. You remember the backgrounds I taught you how to make for indoors? Guess what? You can take those backgrounds outdoors into the field and pop them behind your flowers and you'll have a natural background behind your flower. Just like when I shoot them and I get that blurred background, I've done the same thing with my printed backgrounds. I've shot a subject out of focus, printed it, and I can put that behind my flower when I'm out in the field in a situation like you see here, and I'll have a natural background behind my flower. And I can literally shoot as high as f-stop I want because all it's going to do is reach back to that print and capture that solid color. So that would be your option in situations like this. Now, I like to still go out and shoot like I taught you earlier, look for that isolated subject, work, work it so the background is off in the distance and, uh, and do it kind of naturally like that because I just, it's more challenging. It's fun for me to do it that way. And I feel better when I get it done like that uh, because I feel like it's just more natural. Um, but I have shot many times where I'm in the situation like you see here where I can't get that flower with the background off in the distance. So I don't have any problem popping a background behind it. Now, if you're shooting, you know, up here where I live in the north, the spring flowers, all the spring flowers are woodland flowers and they're all very low to the ground. I mean, literally, you know, six inches, 10 inches above the ground and they're all in clutter. Uh, and there's really just no way you can shoot those with a background off in a distance like later in the summer when you're shooting field flowers and you have these big open fields. So that's a totally different situation. And I will use backgrounds most all the time behind those uh, flowers, because like I said, I just can't get uh, a flower with a situation where there's a background 10, 15 feet away from it. Uh, so I do some of my photography with backgrounds, uh, but I try to do as much as I can without the background, just because I say it's, it's just more challenging, more fun for me. And I feel better when I get it done that way. But I don't have anything against people that just want to go out and put backgrounds behind their flowers all the time. I mean, it's your art. It's however you want to do it, right? So uh, if, the, if that's what works best for you, then do it that way. Now, as far as taking those prints out in the field, because you're probably all wondering, like, what size do you take? All the backpacks, or I would say most backpacks that are being designed today, that are being sold, have a a little sleeve area built into the backpack. And those are, that area is designed to, to you know, slide in a laptop or a notebook into that area. And that little sleeve area is the perfect place to slide in your backgrounds. Now, I have a smaller backpack because I don't have a lot of equipment that I carry when I go out. And so my backpack isn't that big, but it will accommodate an eight and a half by 11 inch print. And I can buy, you know, matte paper in an eight and a half by 11. So I just buy that paper. I print on, you know, my background onto that paper. And you also want to add some kind of backing onto that paper because you don't want to go out there with this flimsy little piece of paper, you know, flopping around behind your print. You want to back it with, say, like foam core, uh, matte board, cardboard, anything that can stiffen that print up. Now, in order to attach that print onto that backboard, get yourself some two-sided carpet tape. Now, two-sided carpet tape has glue on both sides of the tape so that you can apply it onto the backboard and then it'll be sticky stuff there on the other side so that you can take your print, place it on top of the backboard and you'll have a nice firm backboard that you can put behind your flower so it'll stand up straight and won't flop around on you. Now, you could hold these things behind them with your hand, but you remember the plant that I, I, I showed you that you use to hold your diffusers? You can also use your plant uh, to, to hold your backgrounds behind your flower. So that would be a, 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 another option to use that plant for is holding your backgrounds, just like we use it to hold your diffusers. So um, get get yourself some backgrounds, like I said, because you're going to use them indoors. Uh, you like it where you guys are, it's too hot in the summertime to go out. So you stay indoors and shoot. Uh, and uh, you can also use them to hold uh, uh, when you're outdoors shooting too. So give yourself options. When you're shooting um, your subject out in the field, I imagine most people, what they do is they just kind of guess at one f-stop and uh, they shoot with one f-stop and then they get home and they pop it on their computer and look at their screen and they go, hmm, I don't like what I'm seeing. 
uh, I didn't get enough depth of field at that f-stop, or maybe you wanted less depth of field, you wanted more of a shallow look, okay? It's crazy to go out there and set up and then only shoot one f-stop. Make sure when you're out there, shoot at least three to five different f-stops. Three to five, I would say five is better, but you know, you could get by with three different f-stops. So that when you get home, you have, say, five options to look at. And out of those five different f-stops, you're probably going to hit one that you're going to like. All right. But don't come home with one f-stop. You may not be able to go back and reshoot that subject again. And it may not even be there when you go back to reshoot it. It might have withered away or it might be a live subject that's gone now. So make sure that while you're set up with your tripod and you're shooting your subject that you shoot at least minimum three and even better, probably five different f-stops. And when you get home, you have options. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Now, this is a pair of Dame, I'm sorry, I keep saying Dame's rug, uh, calla lilies. This is a pair of calla lilies that I set up in my house on my stairway there. And I just put a black background behind them. Now, um, I'm shooting the first one at 2.8. That's the smallest f-stop on my macro lens. And you can see uh, the front flower. All I have in focus is this little tip here that I focus on right there. Um, so even the edge of this front flower and some of this is out of focus and you can see what happened to the flower that's right behind it. It's blurred into a nice kind of blur. It's still the little details where you can see, but it's blurred out pretty well. So then I go to the next f-stop, which is f8. Now, when I said shoot three to five different f-stops, I don't mean f-stops right next to each other. I mean, skip a few f-stops. Every time you shoot, skip a few. So I went from 2.8, I jumped up to f8, and there's the f8. So you can see that I'm bringing in a little more details on that uh, flower in the background, a little more on the front. And then I went to f11. So a little more details on the back flower, a little more in focus on the front. And then I went to F16, so it looks even more in focus, everything. But then I went to F22, and I got pretty much everything in focus at F22. So now I have those five options. And so I can go back and look at these, and I can say, do I want everything in focus on this image? Or do I want to go with the F16, where it's just a slight out of focus on the back flower? Or maybe a little bit more out of focus on the back flower at F11? Or maybe F8? Or do I want maximum blur at the 2.8? So at least I have the five options and I can go through and study these five and then pick out the one I like or maybe two I like and then scrap the rest of them. All right. All right, so here is a pair of sunflower seed, uh, sunflowers and I went to a local farmer's market on a Saturday morning when they sell their vegetables and they have flowers and things. And I picked up these two sunflowers and I brought them home and I put them on the floor of my foyer in my in front of my house where I have all that nice natural light. Now I just set the one on top of the other kind of so that you could see the bottom one. I just framed it so you get a little bit of the center part at the bottom corner. And then you can see almost the full center uh, on the top one with the petals kind of obscuring it a little bit. Now, there is a lot of depth from the front to the back, and I'm kind of shooting at a slight angle to this rather than directly over top. And there's a lot of depth from the front to the back. Um, so I need maximum depth of field to get that all in focus from front to back. And as you can see, it looks very sharp all the way through. Now, this was shot at F32. Like I've been telling you, when I want maximum depth of field, I'll go to the highest F-stop, F32, to get maximum depth of field. Now, a lot of you out there are cringing right now because you've been taught over all the years, you've been photographing, never shoot over F-16. And the reason being is because when you get into the higher F-stops and, uh, you know, 22 up to 32, you're going to start seeing diffraction. Now, diffraction what it does is, is when you shoot a subject in the high f-stop, the diffraction actually softens down the details in the subject you just shot. So you're not getting the sharpest quality out of the lens when you shoot at the highest f-stops. So when we're shooting um, with our lens, there is an aperture inside there and that aperture opens and closes. And when you're shooting at the smallest f-stop, 
that aperture is what we call wide open. It's at the largest opening. And as we go into the higher f-stops in the f8s, 11, 16, 22, 32, that aperture inside starts to shrink down to a smaller and smaller and smaller opening until we get to 32 and it's at the smallest opening. It's a little tiny hole there that the image is trying to squeeze through. Now, when we're photographing that subject at f32 with that little small opening, the light from that subject is trying to squeeze through that little tiny hole. And as it's trying to squeeze through that little hole, it kind of shifts a little bit back and forth. And when it hits your sensor, it softens down the details of the subject you just photographed. It doesn't give you the sharpest quality out of the lens. Now, that's what we call again diffraction. Now, most photographers would lead you to believe that your image is gonna come out blurry when you shoot at F32. Well, that is not the case. It will be slight softness, okay? Don't think that it's gonna be coming out of there blurry. It's gonna be just a slight out of focus, very slight, all right? And sometimes with the eye, when you put it out there, you can't even see it unless you blow it up, but there'll be a little sl slight softness there, okay? now. The nice thing about digital photography is we have these great post-processing tools, you know, Photoshop, Smart Photo Editor, we have uh, Nick Software, Topaz. Uh, so we have these great post-processing programs and all those programs, every program that you buy for post-processing has a sharpening tool built in or they'll offer it for sale. You know what the sharpening tool is designed for? Sharpening your image. Yeah, you get a little slight softness from that F32, that sharpening tool is going to fix it for you, okay? I've been doing this for 20 years, never had a problem uh, with shooting high f-stops and getting sharp images because I have the tools to correct it. Just like you have the tools in post-processing to correct your exposures, you correct your colors, you correct your contrast, you can correct the slight softness you're going to get when you shoot at f32 by using that sharpening tool. That's what it's designed for. Um, Topaz had just come out with a brand new sharpening program they'll sell you, and they claim they can take a blurry image and make it look sharp. That's how advanced it is with no halos and no artifacts. Uh, because these new sharpening tools are just so much more advanced than what you're thinking maybe back in the early days when they came out with Photoshop. So we have the tools to correct it. So don't be afraid. If I want maximum depth of field, I'm going to go to that F32 and I know that I can sharpen it if there's any slight softness. All right. But I'm really not even getting that much uh, out of focus when I shoot at those high F stops. Now, let me tell you a little story here too. You have all heard of the most famous of all nature and landscape photographers, Ansel Adams. I don't know any photographer that I've ever talked to that if you asked if you've heard of Ansel Adams, there's not one that I've ever talked to that says, no, I've never heard of Ansel Adams. Everybody knows who Ansel Adams is. Heck, people that are non-photographers, a lot of people know who Ansel Adams is. Uh, I remember years ago when I started my business, I went to a print shop here to get some flyers made up. And I went into that print shop and on the walls was hanging a whole bunch of images from Yosemite that Ansel Adams shot. Uh, and here's a non-photographer uh, that knows who Ansel Adams is, because again, um, he's just the most famous photographer of all time. Now, in 1932, Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, who was another really famous photographer from back in those days, uh, and a bunch of other photographers out in California started a photo club, just like your photo club, and they called their club Group F64, because they were shooting in the high f-stops to get maximum depth of field. That's why they called their group f64. So uh, Ansel Adams was shooting at those high f-stops to get his landscapes in focus from front to back. He wanted maximum depth of field and he was shooting at f64. And then um, Edward Weston was doing, um, he was doing like compositions of setups of fruit and stuff in his in his studio and he was shooting them at f64 and then there was another photographer that was shooting a series of calla lilies all at f64 and that's why they called the group f64 because that's their philosophy we want maximum depth of field we want everything in focus we're shooting at the highest f stops so i guess if it's good enough for ansel adams the most famous of all photographers it's good enough for me okay all right now 
we need to talk about what makes a successful image. I've had a lot of success with my macro photography, won a lot of awards and contests. I've been published in tons of magazines. Um, I speak at photo conferences for Tamron and I've been very successful with my photography and I have to analyze and try to figure out what am I doing that's creating good images that are successful. Uh, in your club, I'm sure you have certain photographers in your club that when you have uh, maybe uh, a night where everybody's bringing images in the show or you're having comp competitions, um, there's certain photographers within your group that continually monthly bring in amazing images. And you wonder what is it that they're doing that maybe you're not doing to get those great images. So basically when I analyze what I've done over the years, I found that um, there's three things that happen. Uh, I, I have to find really good subject matter, or I even like to find what I call great subject matter. I want to find really great subject matter. And then I want to compose it well. I want to make sure I compose it well. And then I got to do some good post-processing on those images. Those three things is what you need. This is real simple stuff. This is not that complicated. You just need good subject matter, compose it well, good post-processing. So what are you feeding into your camera? Because I told you earlier, I don't care if you have a $500 entry level DSLR that will produce excellent macro images, but it's what you're feeding into that camera that makes all the difference, okay? Now, if I feed into my camera some animal feces, I will have a poor subject matter. I like the composition on this image here. I like the dark color of the feces, kind of this angle here. And then I like the opposite angle of the light colored tree trunk below it here. Uh, the feces is in the top third of the frame kind of. So I think compositionally it's worked out pretty well. Maybe the post-processing is okay, but it's got a poor subject matter, all right? So if I post this on my Facebook page today, I'm not gonna get a lot of likes on that image. If I enter this into a contest, I'm not gonna win that contest with animal feces. Um, again, I'm being a little bit funny here, but it makes my point. If you shoot poor subject matter, you're going to have poor quality images. So here's a good subject. It's an interesting flower, but it's composed all out of whack, right? So it doesn't matter if you have an amazing subject, but if you compose it poorly, well, you entered into your club monthly contest with the judge, they're going to knock you down in points. You're not going to get your 30 points. Maybe you'll get 26 or 27 because you're going to lose points for poor composition. So again, we're missing, uh, you know, one of those three elements that I was talking about. Lastly, we have to do good post processing. That's a huge part of digital photography and what we're doing today. We have to do some really good post processing on our images. Now, let's talk about the most famous photographer again, Ansel Adams. Why is he the most famous? You know, he was around 100 years ago almost, and he's still today the most famous of all landscape nature photographers. And why is that? Well, Ansel Adams introduced the world to Yosemite and it produced these amazing images. He found the best subject matter in Yosemite. He composed them really well. And you know what else he was really good at? post-processing. People talk all the time about Ansel Adams' amazing skills in the darkroom. He was a master at dodging and burning that created this amazing contrast within his images. They're black and whites. And that strong contrast made his images pop. And so he stood out from all the other photographers of that time for landscape photography because of his great post-processing skills. So again, that's a huge part of what we do to make a successful image. So Ansel Adams, one of the most famous of all time, had amazing subject matter because he was the first one to shoot those images of the Yosemite and show them to people. Now, every year, people flock the Yosemite to shoot the exact same images that Ansel Adams shot, but he's the originator of it. So he had amazing images or amazing sub subjects, composed them well, and then he did good post-processing in his darkroom. That's why he's the most famous. Now, this is a subject that I shot at the Cox Arboretum. Cox Arboretum is 50 miles north of Cincinnati, Ohio. I was heading down 75. I saw this little sign, Cox Arboretum. I thought, hmm, I'm going to get off here and check it out. So 
um, found this subject and I got really excited because I, I, I've never ever seen a subject that looked like this. And I thought it was just so cool. So, and I've actually never seen it since that day when I shot it. Uh, it's the only time I've ever seen this subject. So it's a pretty cool subject. Um, now, when I was heading, I was actually heading to Cincinnati to do a workshop that weekend. And so when I got there on Friday after I photographed this at the Cox Arboretum, I wanted to get on my laptop and start doing my post processing. I was pretty excited about this image. Now, my typical post processing would be um, add a little bit of color boost, you know, a little saturation in there to bring out the colors a little more. And then I would do some contrast boost, you know, to add a little bit more contrasts, lights and darks and stuff to get a little separation in the large lights and darks. And then I would do any little sharpening if it needs it. Okay. Now this image here, because of the depth from the front, you know, the very top to down into the bottom was shot at F32. And you can see this is the original image out of the camera. So like I said, your images are not going to come out blurry at F32. There's going to be some slight softness. And so there is a little bit of slight softness here because so it needs a little bit of sharpening. So I did my basic post processing and it was okay. You know, it was all right. Um, but I thought I'd get a little creative and Nick software had came out at the time when I shot this with uh, color effects pro four. It's a software program that uh, Nick doesn't own anymore. DXO owns the, owns the uh, Nick programs now they'll sell you the same programs but uh, uh, get them from DxO but it was called color effects pro 4 now in color effects it had 57 different creative filters that you could literally just click on a mouse onto that filter and it would create a different look on your image and so I was going down these different filters clicking on them one after another and I was getting down towards the bottom and uh, there was a filter called solarization. When I clicked on solarization, that's what happened to that image. I was blown away when I saw the effect of solarization on this image right here. Now these things are emerging out of a black hole and all the petals are super highlighted. It's just so cool looking at what that filter did. And all I did was click on the, uh, on the mouse and that happened. And I was like, whoa, look at that. Um, I was uh, doing a program the other day for a club and the, um, the host had, had broken into the, the uh, program and he says, you know what solarization uh, in, the, in the dark room days when we were doing in the dark room, they would do something where they would turn on the lights in the dark room and then turn them off real fast and it would create this kind of effect like you see here. And I had you know, never heard of that because when I started in photography, I'd only shot a couple years of film and I wasn't doing any darkroom stuff. I was just getting the images processed and then I got into digital. So I had no idea that that term solarization was actually from the darkroom days where uh, they would be doing their processing. And he said they would turn on a light and turn it off and it would create different effects onto that image with that light exposing it. Um, so he says, that's what solarization means. And I was fascinated because I had no idea what that term meant when they applied it to that filter. And of course, this is the results from that filter. Now, I have people that ask me like, out of all your images you shot, which is your favorite? And I would have to say it's this one. Um, and, and it's not just because of you know the subject matter, because if I would have just stuck with this image here with some color enhancement, contrast boost, little sharpening, I would not put that image in my top 10. It's a nice subject, but I think I have other images that I like better subject matter wise than this one here. But once I applied that filter and got that there, that became my number one favorite image uh, because of that filter that was applied. Now, if you go to my website, uh, you'll see uh, this image will pop up on my website as the uh, first image that you see. It's my uh, main image in my front of my website. And then also on my Facebook page, uh, at the banner at the top, you'll see I use a portion of this as my banner on Facebook. So I think it's just turned out to be a really cool image. And it's mainly because of that filter that was applied. So as I said, good subject matter, compose well, good post-processing. Now, this is a calla lily that I photographed in my home. Uh, I just put a black background behind it. Now, you can see the image on the left side 
that's the flower with the black background. Now the black background, when I photographed it, turned to kind of a bluish color. And the flower itself is not a very saturated, it's not very colorful, but I don't worry about those things that are happening when it comes out of the camera, because I know in my post-processing, I'm going to fix all those things. And that's the great thing that we, you know, we're, we're blessed with these tools from post-processing to take a bland looking image out of the camera like that and turn it into the one you see on the right side. Now, what I was able to do is go in and blacken out that background, take that bluish color you see and just darken it into a black. And then you can see the color, obviously, I've added in saturation to bring out those colors of that flower. And then the lines that are in the flower petals, I use the soft focus filter to soften down those lines so that they're not as sharp. It's just, you know, nice little solid color uh, petals there. So again, out of the camera, not very pretty. I wouldn't show that to anybody like that. Uh, but with our post-processing skills, uh, we can make it into a really nice image. Now, a lot of you are going to be really surprised if you haven't seen me talk before or, or maybe uh, come to a program that I've done in the past. Um, my images are all JPEGs. And I'm sure a lot of you are probably freaking out when you hear that. You go, you're kidding me. You shoot JPEGs? You've always been told by every instructor, everybody in your your camera club that you should never shoot jpeg you should always shoot um, raw files uh, i started out in 2004 shooting jpegs because in 2004 to buy a one gig hear that one gig compact flash card was 250 dollars a one gig card could only hold 35 raw files and about 170 some jpegs I didn't have money to be buying a whole bunch of compact flash cards. So I just, like I went to Yosemite with my very first camera, my Fuji S2, and I had one compact flash card. Well, guess what I'm shooting? I'm shooting JPEGs. Now here's the other problem in 2004. I, I'm cheap, so I had a cheap tower computer. Now, you know that most photographers that are buying computers today to process, they're buying, trying to buy, you know, at least minimum eight gigs of RAM. A lot of them say you should have 16 gigs of RAM. Well, I don't even know if that cheap tower computer in 2004 even had one gig of RAM. I doubt it even had one gig. And the hard drive was nowhere near what we get on a hard drive when we buy a computer today. So you couldn't store all these large file images and you couldn't process them very fat, fast because of the computer system couldn't handle it. And so I was shooting, uh, I, I did shoot a, a raw file and I brought it in and I was going to you know, do some post process in Photoshop. And whenever I would click on something to happen, it would sit there for 20 seconds before it actually happened. Um, and I said, well, I can't deal with this. And so with my JPEGs, when I clicked on something, it would happen right away. And so that's uh, why I was shooting JPEGs at that time. Now, obviously here we are, you know, what, 16 years later, and uh, we've got, you know, super fast computers and we've got terabytes in our computers and we have uh you know 64 gig uh sd cards that you can buy for next to nothing so it's not an issue today with space and with shooting you know having fast computers to process and all that but i actually still shoot my jpegs even today because they work for me i haven't had any problem with them so um so you know a lot of people say well you don't shoot jpegs because it compresses the image makes it a uh, less information in the file, but you can look at my images and tell me if you see any any pixels are missing. <laughs> I don't think you're going to find that. So JPEGs are not all that bad. Um, so I continue to still use my JPEGs today. Now, this is something on occasion I do. I put a couple images on my Facebook page and I asked the viewers if they would uh, just take a second and hit the like button on the image that you think is the better of the two images you see here, hit the like button on that one you like the best. So you can see these are both same subject matter. Both image have a feather lying on sand at a beach. So they're both the same subject matter. Now the image on the left, as you can see here, got 102 likes. 
102 people like that image more than the one on the right side. Now, four people picked the one on the right side as the better image. I think those four people out of their minds. I don't know why they thought that that image on the right was better than the image on the left, but four people did. Should have been 106 to zero. Now, let's analyze these two images. Image on the left, very interesting artistic feather laying on the beach. Now, look at the separation in the veining that happened. Look at the lines, look at the, look at the S curve right here. We always talk about S curves. Look at this little grouping right here that split into a V at the end. And look at this little grouping right here that kind of overlaps over top of this other little grouping. And then you had some of the sand that kind of filtered down inside the flower here. Now also, um, I did some post-processing that warmed up the tones in that image of the sand and the feather. The image on the right side has a boring feather. It is not interesting at all compared to the one on the left. It's straight lines, veining, straight edges, not artistic at all. And the post-processing is lacking, no post-processing. So it's just bland looking. So when you put two images, again, same subject matter, uh, side by side, but you have one that has a more artistic looking feather like you see opposed to the boring one on the right side and you put in some warm tones and post processing and make it look a little more appealing uh, than the one on the right side that's bland. That's why you get 102 likes and you only get four on the other image. So again, good subject matter composed well, good post processing. Um, you're going to get 102 likes to four. So very important that you're always searching out really top quality, good subjects. Now in 2001, I bought my very first camera. I went to eBay, I bought a uh, Nikon N80 film camera. I bought a couple, you know, a couple lenses, used lenses, and I bought a tripod and head. And I had this, you know, goal, I was going to go out and be a nature photographer. And I remember prior to that, I did every once in a while pick up a you know, outdoor photographer, and I would look through the image and I think, wow, these are really cool. You know, I'd like to do that someday. So in 2001, I decided I was going to do this, right? So I bought all my used equipment, went out to the local parks. I'm lucky I've got four parks within 20 minutes of my home, and I could literally make my living just working in those four parks and without even ever going anywhere else. So I remember seeing these some dead tree trunks, standing dead trees, and on the uh, bark of these trees would grow this fungus. And I'd never seen anything like that before because I'm, you know, new to this photography thing and I'm just looking out for fine details to photograph. And so I saw this weird fungus growing out of the size of tree trunk and I was fascinated by it. I thought, oh, look at this. There's some cool stuff to photograph, right? The problem is it's not cool stuff. It's a, it's a blob of white, just a big massive blob of white growing out of an ugly tree trunk. It's not a good subject matter. It's an ugly subject. But at the time, I didn't know the difference between good and bad subjects. I was just photographing all kinds of things. And in the first three years that I was photographing, three years, not one image in those three years is on my website today. I've shot for three years, and none of those images that I shot are on my website today because I was, you know, learning how to use my camera. I was learning what, what good subject from poor subject was. It took into the fourth year before I finally got it together and started doing really nice work. So that's a poor subject matter. Now, let me show you some really cool fungus. Ah, uh, that's some cool fungus. Now that's fungus grown out of a dead tree too, but that's cool fungus. Very interesting designs of all those and the way they're all kind of situated together. It just came out to be a really cool image. So that's good fungus grown out of a dead tree trunk, and that's poor fungus. So again, poor subject matter, good subject matter. Here's an old ratty fern, and you want to make sure you always find good quality subjects to shoot, right? This is all tore up and it's ugly looking, so you wouldn't want to photograph that. But look at this fern here. Ooh, that's a beautiful fern. When I bought my camera in in 2004, my digital camera, that Fuji S2, that was a six megapixel camera. That was the most you could buy in megapixels in 2004. That was the highest, all right, six megapixels. I was buying that camera because a friend of mine and, 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 I, and I were going to Yosemite to photograph, you know, the landscapes like Ansel Adams photographed. 
So I was there doing some macro photography. I had a 180 macro lens. And I came across this burned area where all these dead tree trunks were burned up and laying on the ground. And all around these tree trunks were growing these green, beautiful green ferns. And a lot of them were growing over top of these tree trunks. And I thought, you know what? That is such an amazing subject. That fern is just so nice and detailed and all kinds of nice textures in there. And look at the contrast between the green and the black burned log. And look at all the textures in that log. And I thought, wow, that's a really cool subject. And this is in my fourth year of shooting. Remember I told you? It took into the fourth year before I finally put it together. Now, this image shot with that Fuji S2 6 megapixel camera is my most successful image that I ever photographed. Yeah, it's financially the most successful image I ever photographed. This image won highly honored in the Winland Smith International Competition. Um, it won uh, in other contests that I entered it into. Uh, it was uh, published in Outdoor Photographer Magazine in three separate issues. It was published three times in Outdoor Photographer Magazine. It was published in other magazines. Uh, it was a good seller when I was in the art show business for seven years. And the company Hewlett Packard bought the rights to this image. They actually own this image for all advertising. So it's been a very good financial you know, image for me. It's the best that I've ever photographed. And yet it was done in 2004. What's that? 16, 17 years ago with a Fuji S2 6 megapixel camera. So when I tell you that you don't need an expensive camera to produce top quality macro images, this proves it what I'm telling you. Okay. And you know what that was shot at? F32. Oh, you all know about palms down there, fan palms. Now, I usually go down, I try to get down in April to Florida, and I will travel around and do some workshops. Uh, and last year, I was disappointed, obviously, because of COVID, and I had to cancel all my programs last year, and so I didn't get down to Florida. Uh, I actually got my first COVID shot here about a week ago, and in a couple of weeks, I get my other one. And then they say within 10 days, I think, or so many days after that, then you're fully protected, hopefully. And so I'm planning on traveling again as soon as I get that second COVID shot. Um, so I'm hoping to get down into Florida in April. Um, you know, so I'm going to uh, go to, you know, like the uh, botanical gardens. And I like to shoot at uh, some of the different parks and stuff in different areas of Florida. And I love shooting fan palms. I just think they're really, really cool subjects. This here, as you see, is a very poor subject. It's not, it's got, you know, the edges, the tips are all broken off and brown and you got edges of the little fan there all, you know, tore up and you got little lines coming in and out of the scene from all over the place. So it's just a poor subject to shoot. But uh, this is a much better fan palm. That one there is really cool. Now, I posted this on my Facebook page today and a bunch of other sites. You may have seen it if you follow me. But um, I think fan palms are cool because at the base down at the bottom, you see you get those lines that radiate 360 degrees all around that base down there. And I think that's just really cool. So uh, I also... Uh, you know, I changed obviously the color, as you guys all know, the fan palms are green. And I, in post-processing, I did some creative filters to kind of create some different shades of colors in there to just make it a little more interesting. Now, the one thing about when you're shooting these really great subjects that you're gonna photograph, you're never gonna get a subject that's not gonna have some kind of little specks in there, you know, like little dirt specks, um, maybe little small round circles of decay. Um, you, you're just gonna never find them in perfect pristine condition. There's always gonna be some little imperfections within that plant. And that's the nice thing about our post-processing tools is that we can go in there and clean up all those little specks. I always try to get as many of those little specks out of there as I can. And this is no different than if you were a photographer that photographed models, you know, headshots of models or, or actors, and you put them on a cover of People magazine. They don't go on those covers with the actual complexion of those people. They go in there and they, what they used to call airbrushing, or they go in there and digitally manipulate so that the skin is very smooth and perfect on their faces. And the actors don't want you to see their actual face on their, you know, in, in all the little imperfections. So they clean all that up. 
And that's what we want to do with our images. We want to clean up all those little imperfections in our subjects so they're perfect looking. So I go through and I clean up every little speck of dirt and every little spot of decay and all that stuff and clean them up. And everything you shoot, you're never going to find them perfect. And if you do, it's pretty rare. You want to have, you're going to have some kind of little thing you got to clean up when you get into post-processing. Now here's a nasty looking pond with some lily pads on it. And you see all those little specks on the lily pads. That's what I'm talking about. You see all those little white specks and black specks. Those are the things that I'm talking about. This is a very poor quality subject, obviously. And you're probably thinking, well, who would shoot something that ugly? I'm on about five or six different macro groups on Facebook that I post on every single day. And I view hundreds of images every single day on those groups. And I got to tell you, I do see a lot of images that are really poor quality subject matter. And I think just like you're thinking about this image, why would you shoot that? I mean, it just, it's ugly looking. Um, but I have to remember in my first three years that I was shooting, I was shooting poor quality subjects. And so I have to think, well, maybe these people that are posting these images on, on some of these groups that I'm seeing, maybe they just haven't got to that level yet to understand the difference between good and poor quality subjects. Maybe they're beginners, you know, so I have to cut them a little slack thinking, well, they, you know, I was at that stage in my first three years. So uh, maybe that's where they're at. It's, it, you really have to look at a subject and really say, is it really an interesting or is it a good quality subject or is it really a poor quality? You know, it's pretty simple to figure that out. Now look at these lily pads. Woo, those are beautiful lily pads. Now this was uh, just being in the right place at the right time because uh, I had a friend uh, that uh, I went out to shoot. He lived in the area of the Cuyahoga National Park in Ohio. And I went to visit him. We were out shooting at the park and it's big old storm came through, big nasty dark clouds and it stormed. And so we had to go back to his house and he says, you know what, I'm going to make lunch. Why don't you grab your gear and go out in the backyard and photograph some of the flowers. His wife had this amazing flower gardens out back and he had a little pond out there. And he says, why don't you go out and shoot? So these dark storm clouds were just starting to move out of the area and right behind it was clear sky. And so there's this kind of weird filtered light that was hitting the edge of these backside of these dark clouds and it was hitting the pond and uh, creating that weird light that you see around the rim lighting around the edge of the, uh, the lily pads, kind of that white glow that you're getting. That was just the light that was hitting that angle of the water, what they call surface tension around the edge of the, the lily pads. Uh, so you see these lily pads are nice clean lily pads and they probably had a couple little specks of dirt in there that I had to clean up and then you get the nice little water drops that were left over from the rain on the pads. But it's that lighting effect that happened during that uh, afternoon and again it was just in the right place at the right time for that light to create that weird effect on the water that you see there. So good subject, really good subject. Now, when I'm out there shooting, and, and especially like in the in the fields and the woods and, uh, and and botanical gardens, I go to a lot of botanical gardens. Matter of fact, you guys have one down there that's probably not, I don't know if it's too far from you guys, Sarasota Botanical Gardens. And I shot a lot of cool stuff there a couple of years ago when I was down there in April. And um, uh I'm looking for unusual subject matter, something that I can show people that they haven't seen before. Just like that one I showed you earlier where I applied the solarization filter. That was a unique subject that you don't see posted by anybody. It's something totally different. And this is another one I have never, ever seen. And like I said, I have viewed just many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of images on the internet on all the different photo groups. And I've never seen this image of this subject. It's just an interesting subject. And I found it at the Chicago Botanical Garden. It was in the greenhouse that held the tropical plants. And I was walking around in that greenhouse and I just happened to be up high where I looked over a railing and down below the railing was this plant. And it looks like a spiral staircase that winds down into this, you know, the bottom down there. And I thought, man, is that a cool plant. Um, a lot of depth from the very top part on, down into the bottom part. So again, I shot it at F32 to get it all in focus. Um, and I don't, I have no idea what the plant was. I don't remember the name of it, but it's just a very cool plant. And when I post this out there and show it to people, I get a lot of, you know, wow, that's really cool because it's just an interesting subject matter. And again, like I said, look for great subjects. 
Now, this is a very interesting shot of a black-eyed Susan flower. It's covered in heavy frost. Obviously, down where you live, you're not going to be able to do this. But where I live, we get frost usually about the middle of October and on. Uh, but the problem is black-eyed Susans by the middle of October are usually dead and gone in the parks. This was a very early freak, early frost, while the black-eyed Susans were fully standing erect out in the uh, fields. And I knew that the frost was coming when I listened to the weather and I grabbed all my gear that morning. I ran out to the park because I knew that the frost was going to add an interesting look on top of all the flowers and the plants and the, everything out there. So I uh, got this really nice shot of this black-eyed Susan covered in frost. Now, this same composition that you see here, if you remove that frost from this flower, what do you got? Well, just a close-up of a black-eyed Susan. It's not going to impress anybody because there's millions of shots of black-eyed Susans already out there. But when you add that frost on there, it makes it a unique image that very few people have. So again, great subject matter. When I go out to the parks near me, there's a lot of dead trees laying on the woodland you know, floor, uh, trees that have blown over in windstorms, and they've been laying there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and all the bark has just fallen off of these trees and exposed all the underside. Occasionally, you run into some of these trees that have cavities, holes in those tree trunks. And so when I first came across the very first hole, when I started, this was way back in 2004, I think it was, um, when I discovered this cavity inside this tree trunk, um, I put uh, flowers in there. And I thought, wow, that's a cool hole to make into a flower vase, a natural flower vase for flowers. So over the years, I would find different uh, cavities in tree trunks. Well, a few years after that first one I found, I found this tree trunk right here. And this is a very interesting artistic design in that cavity, the way it, the way it kind of formed. I always tell people, you know, Mother Nature creates the, the best artwork, and it's up to the photographers to find it, all right? Um, this image right here, you're looking at those flowers, and you're thinking those flowers are tulips. And you know tulips are pretty big, so you're probably thinking, wow, that's got to be a pretty big area right there. Well, you'd be wrong because that whole area there that I photographed is only about six inches wide by nine inches long. And those little flowers are called orange star. They're only one inch tall, about one inch tall each flower. So they're really tiny flowers. It took me four months before I was able to find small enough flowers to fit down into that little cavity. And when I found them, I got all excited, bought them, ran out to the park, located that tree trunk and uh, put those flowers in there. Now, Tamron, who's one of my sponsors, um, they do a, a lens cloth that they give out for free at all the conferences they go to. They, you know, when people walk by their booth, they give them a lens cloth. Well, they print a photo onto those lens cloths. So one year they contact me, and says, we want one of your images to print on our lens cloth. I says, well, go to my website and tell me which one you want. And this is the one they picked for their lens cloth that year come out really nice. Here's another thing that I don't see anybody else doing. And, and I'm always looking for something that I can do that nobody else is doing, because that's what's going to make me stand out. Just as this is the same as what made Ansel Adams stand, stand out when he went to Yosemite and shot the first images there that, you know, that exposed people to Yosemite. I was out in uh, one of the local parks in the early spring. And I just happened to notice that the buds that were on the tree branches were starting to break open. And out of these little buds were coming these interesting little artistic formations. And I thought, wow, is that cool? Little artistic, you know, little, little tiny branches with little leaves that are starting to unfold out of that little, uh, you know, bud. And it just was a really cool little subject. And again, something I'd never seen anybody else doing before. So I was pretty excited. I thought, wow, I'm the first one to kind of do something like this. So every year in the spring, I watch the tree buds. Now you got to watch them real careful because uh, once those buds open and those little stems and leaves pop out of there, well, then you've lost the composition. You know, the best part is when it's just starting to pop out of there and just getting a little bit of this formation like you see in this image here. You can see those leaves are still curled up into that, uh, that little branch that's coming out of there. And you know it's going to kind of pop open when it gets to that point. But uh, 
yeah, watch the buds. You know, obviously I got to wait till heck, almost May before the buds start to pop out here. You guys, you know, I don't know when your buds will start popping if they ever do, but <laughs> make sure you watch them as they're just starting to open and photograph them. Now, um, tulips are always fun to shoot. And, you know, tulips are, you know, so photographed. I mean, there's just billions of billions of images of, you know, tulips out there that people photograph. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a good subject matter. Uh, now, this is actually um, North Carolina, Duke University. Uh, I was doing a workshop in Raleigh, and, and one of the participants there says, hey, I'm going over to Duke University on Monday. If you're going to be in the area, you know, I'll meet you over there. So I said, yeah, it sounds like uh, fun. I'm, I'm looking for places to go shoot. So I go over there on Monday morning, and she's all excited because the tulips are up, and she's going there mainly because she wants to shoot the tulips. So there's a little stone pathway you see up in the uh, upper right corner there, and she's on that pathway, and she's got her tripod real low to the ground, and, and she's got this tulip framed up in her, in her uh, camera, and I, she says, would you mind looking at my uh, my image that I framed up here and tell me what you think. And so basically what I saw when I looked at the viewfinder is just a tulip head in the top third of the frame and a stem under it. That is the most boring way you could possibly shoot a flower. All right. It's been done a zillion times like that. Okay. So it's just basically repeating the same thing everybody else has done over and over. And so she's basically uh, you know, going to photograph this tulip in the top there with the stem under it. And again, not going to impress anybody because it's been done way too many times. Okay. So I said to her, I said, Susan, I says, how many times have you seen a tulip framed in a position like you just framed this one? She goes, well, I've seen it done like that a lot. I said, you probably already have on your hard drive at home tulips shot exactly like you just framed this one, don't you? She says, yeah, I, I've got some like that. I says, so you've already accomplished that. Why are you repeating it? You've already got that. You just told me you have those shots at home on your hard drive. So why are you repeating what you've already accomplished? You need to move on and do something else with these tulips, okay? I says, I'm not going to shoot, shoot a tulip in the top there with a the stem under it because it's a boring composition. It's been done a billion times. And uh, I've got a couple shots already of that tulip like that. So I don't need to repeat what I've already accomplished and coming here to come, come up with something different. So I'm looking around through this little patch of tulips and I, I see something pretty interesting. And so I get my camera set up and I frame it, frame up my subject. And I says, Susan, look through my viewfinder and tell me if you've ever seen a shot out of a tulip like this one here. She looks through the viewfinder. She goes, I've never seen anything like that before. And that's what she saw right there. Now, some of these little young tulips were still encased in that green sheathing that you see there. And then in the front part, there was two leaves that were going in opposite directions of each other. And it just made a nice little base down below that image right there. So I actually put a background behind it. The background was actually green that I used behind it, but I, because it, it kind of blended in with the leaves, I actually blacked it out in the background. So this is a, a, a shot of a tulip that I've never seen before. And uh, obviously when I asked Susan if she's ever seen that before, she says, no, I've never seen anything like that before. And that's what I'm looking for. Looking for something that, uh, it, it, you know, nobody else has shot. Something that's a little different from what everybody else has shot. And that's what, again, it's going to create success for your photography. So I, as I studied this little group, I, you know, I'm still looking for something else. So I did find this one here. And I kind of like that one. That's a little different, something different. And then I found another one where I actually did a soft focus on this one. So what I did was I focused on this little tip right here, used the small left stop so that it blurred down into the bottom down here. So I got three unique images out of that little patch and she was willing to settle for a tulip in the top third with a stem under it and wasn't gonna impress anybody with that image. So it's just a different mindset, okay? You have to have that mindset when you go out to shoot that you're looking for unusual different things to shoot but you also have to re you know remember they also have to be something interesting looking you know just because you shoot something different doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean it's a cool subject or an interesting subject so you have to balance those things you got to figure well let's look for a unique subject matter or let's look at for a different way to shoot them so we're not shooting the same as everybody else is shooting them all right 
just like I said about uh, Yosemite, you know, everybody goes there, they want to plant their tripod in the exact same position that Trent Ansel Adams planted his and they want to shoot the exact same scene he did and nobody's impressing anybody with those shots because they've been done too many times. Framing your subject. This is a big part of what we do. We have to make sure we frame it. And this is part of that composition thing. We got to frame it properly. And I see this all the time when I'm viewing these images on all these different sites that I go to. I just saw one today, the exact same thing as what I'm showing you in this picture right here. You've got a tall subject. This is a teasel. Nothing interesting about the subject. I'm just photographing for the, the purpose of showing you a composition here. Tall, skinny subject. When I find a tall, skinny, skinny subject, first thing I'm thinking is that's a horizontal shot, not a, I mean, I'm sorry, a vertical shot because it's a tall, skinny subject. If you shoot it like I have here as a horizontal image, you're going to have this huge gap of nothing over on the right and nothing over on the left. Okay. So that doesn't work for a tall, skinny subject. If it's a vertical subject, you got to shoot as a vertical, not as a horizontal. I always tell people, let's just separate this right here from the rest of the image right here. Is there anything in this whole area here that's making your image a better image? And usually the response is, well, no, not really, because there's nothing there. Exactly. There's nothing there. It's not going to make your image better if there's nothing there to make it better. So why have it there? So make sure when you're shooting tall, skinny subjects, you shoot as a vertical. So when we go to vertical on that same subject, we eliminate all that space around it that is not needed. We don't need all that vacant space because again, it's not helping to make a better image. Also, when you condense it down like that, the subject matter now gets larger in the frame. It takes up more of the frame and you can see more details of the subject better. And that's what we want. We want people to see our subject we're shooting, okay? That's the most important thing. Here's a pair of teasels that are wide. So they work okay as a horizontal because they're filling the frame because they're wide subjects. When we shoot this same subject as a vertical, look what happens to it. We're getting the same framing on the right side and left side of the frame, but look what happens when we shoot a vertical. We get all that stuff up top. Now we might be able to take it down and get more stem there, okay, at the bottom, but then we're going to probably pick up some grasses and stuff growing at the bottom. Here's a dragonfly that is not really tall or not really wide. It's almost square. When you look at it, it's hard to tell whether it's taller than it is wide. And so sometimes we get stuff like teasels that are obviously tall, Okay, or like the other parateasel where they're wide. I mean, it's very easy to spot that they're tall or wide, but this one here is a little bit more difficult. So we're having a trouble trying to decide, well, is this, is this, should this be a vertical or horizontal? Well, if you can't decide, then shoot it both ways. Shoot it as a horizontal, like we did here, and then shoot it as a vertical. I actually like the vertical better than the horizontal. I think it, took up more of the frame when I shot it as a vertical. But I didn't know that until I photographed it. Because again, I couldn't tell whether it was taller than it was wide. Fill the frame for more impact. So this is another thing that I see a lot of photographers do. Um, they have a, a really nice subject maybe, but then they add way too much of the background around the subject. All right, so this is you know an example of a, someone that might say, um, I photographed this flower image. What do you think of it? Well, if I could see the flower, I might like it, but you've got so much of the background in there that the flower just got kind of absorbed into the background. I can't see it hardly. So when you're shooting flowers and critters and stuff, you want to fill the frame as much as possible with them and eliminate all the background and the outside edges, okay? Because it's going to create more impact when the viewer sees your image. So like that there. Now, when you fill the frame like I did here, you see all that fine hairs off the petals and the stem around the flower head stuff, all those little fine hairs that are being backlit from sun in the background. Um, so fill the frame with your subject so it has more impact when it viewer, you know, pops up and viewer sees it. Same with this one here. You got this interesting little leaf here, but it's 
swallowed up by that background. And it's a cool background, but it's just too much of it. You don't need that much. And the main subject is the leaf. So let's get the main subject, fill in the frame a little more. Still got the nice background, but now the leaf is the main subject and popping a little more. Okay, gang, that's all I'm going to teach you for today. But there is a lot more you could learn if you're interested in learning more. And you could join my Macro Photo Club to do that. Now, the Macro Photo Club was something I started three years ago. And uh, my goal was to create an online macro photo club where everybody from all over the country, and actually we got them from all over the world now, uh, would join this and become part of this club. And they would learn how to do macro photography through videos that I would create. Um, we are now at about 100, or I'm sorry, 235 videos that are broken down into four categories. So there's videos on composition, there's videos on post-processing, there's videos on equipment, and there's about a, over a hundred videos of me out in the field actually photographing subjects with my, with my camera and, and tripod and showing you how I do it in these videos. And so it's very, very good learning. And there's a lot more to learn about uh, macro than what I've just taught you here today. So we have uh, three years later, because uh, when I started this, I was hoping to get 100, 150, 200 members. That was my goal. And here we are three years later at 20, over 2,200 members from 18 different countries. I was blown away when I saw these people from all these different countries signing up. So that's pretty cool. Now, we also have sponsors. Uh, I, I've had sponsors over the year that I asked to sponsor my Macro Photo Club. So every month we do a raffle and one of the sponsors will give away uh, you know, some product uh, for that month that I can raffle off. So you have a chance to win something each month. And we also have our own photo club, uh, macro photo club on Facebook just for our members. And about half of our membership is on that uh, Facebook club and they post images, share their images of macro photography. And then they ask questions if they're having, you know, issues or they want to know about some equipment or something, you can ask questions. So it's just like a camera club where you meet together, they talk and discuss things or they share images. And then every month we have a theme uh, and people can photograph that theme for that month and post their images. Now, uh, when I started out, I was trying to figure out what do I charge for membership into this thing? And I know there's a lot of programs out there, lynda.com and, and uh, Visual Wilderness and uh, kelby.com and all these. And they charge you a monthly fee to be a member of those clubs. And I didn't want to get into that. I didn't want to be charging because I don't like monthly fees. Uh, so I just come up with a flat fee of $99. It's a lifetime membership. You never have to pay again. And you'll always have access to the videos and all the other benefits of the being in the club. If you're interested in joining, uh, you go to my website, which is down at the bottom there, you see tinylandscapes.com. And when you get to the site at the top, you'll see some links, different names up there, look for the one that says macro photo club in the very center. And just click on that, it'll take you through the steps to, to join the club. Now they're going to raffle off two free memberships, lifetime memberships into the club. Uh, when I wrap up here. So uh, hopefully maybe so, you know one of you are macro photographers and will win that. All right. Okay. I am all done. So if uh, my host would like to come back in and. Yeah, I'm here. Uh... And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right. So if, uh, if you want to take any questions, if people want to unmute themselves and ask, or if, if they put them in a chat box or something, that would be okay. Yeah, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm actually going to stop the recording at this point. Sure. Um, there we go. Okay.